Hey, praise the Lord. It is Brother Clinton once again. Welcome back to the Word Prophet channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth, as Jesus Christ commanded. You know, the Bible says, Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. The Lord is holy. Um, among many other things, this means that there is none like unto him. He is holy, in him he is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And so God has said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, how are we who were born in sin supposed to be holy? Well, the Bible says the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And so the, by, what Paul is referring to by, by the gospel of Christ in Romans 1.16 is when we obey what Paul and the other apostles preached in order to be saved from our sins, which means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, who is the Holy Ghost? He is the Holy One of Israel. He is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's who the Holy Ghost is. And if you have the Holy Ghost in you, then you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have the Spirit of your Father in you. And if you have the Spirit of your Father in you and you walk after the Spirit, then you will fulfill the righteousness of the law because you won't be walking in sin, as it is written in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And you know, a lot of people in the churches quote the first part of that verse, Romans 8.1. They love to quote Romans 8.1, but only up until the halfway point of that verse. And they love to say, there is therefore no, no, there is therefore now no condemnation. There's no condemnation upon me. They, they just run around kind of like shouting that. But they don't really, most of them don't really finish reading the rest of the verse. And I'll quote it for you again. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You see, so if we walk after the Spirit, then we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. This is a struggle that we must, uh, or that we are involved in every day. And how do we walk in the Spirit? Well, we walk by the leading of the Spirit of God, and of course by abiding in the Word of God, reading what it says and doing it. That's how we abide in Jesus Christ. That's how we abide in His love. That's how we're going to make it into the kingdom of God, because the Bible says in Revelation 22, 14, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and that they may enter in through the gates into the city. You see, those that do not do the commandments of God are not going to have right to the tree of life. And the tree of life is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the tree of life. And those that do not do the commandments of God are not going to enter into the city. Okay, this is what the Bible says. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the concept of modesty, mostly for women, but for women and men. And it's because of a letter that I received today from a disciple, and I want to um, read it. It's just one paragraph, and I want to read it for you, but I'm not going to mention any names that were in the letter, so I'm just going to change the words around a little bit to disguise the names, um, because I'm not into uh, you know, speaking people's names and, and, and making things public when things are sent to me privately. Uh, that wouldn't be very respectful. So here it is. He says, Blessed be the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Brother Clinton, I pray you and your house are well in Jesus' name. I am well. Thank God. The reason I'm emailing is because my wife is having a difficult time with wearing the head covering. We know it speaks of it in Corinthians, but the things that are causing some contentions are the how, when, where does she wear it, and the whole modest apparel thing especially in regards to not wearing pants or shorts. There seems to be some gray areas or uncertainty to what is permissible and what isn't. If you could provide any clarity on the matter, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Brother Clinton. So, having said that, having read that portion of, of well, that's the whole letter, actually. I want to address those things, not only for you, Brother, who wrote, but for all those of you who may be watching this, because this is a question that needs to be answered publicly. Um, because many people struggle with these things and many people uh, have gray areas where they don't understand these things. Now, there are no gray areas according to the scripture, but 
there are some gray areas in people's understanding, so I want to clarify these things. Okay. The Bible says, let's open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I've taught about this before, and so if you'd like a more detailed teaching on this, please let me know in the comment form, and I'll be happy to send you a link to a video that has a more detailed teaching on this. But for right now, I'm just going to go over a couple of verses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm going to just start from the beginning. It says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. We know that this is a royal letter that was written by Paul, the apostle of Christ, to the church at Corinth, and also to the saints uh, all over, to the faithful in Christ Jesus, which includes you and me if you're baptized in his name and filled with his spirit and walking in his commandments. So he says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Now, let me just stop for a moment. I know that many of you may be kind of used to reading your Bible. And when I say that, I don't mean to seem irreverent. What I mean is that you have, maybe you've read this passage so many times that it kind of seems like repetitive to you and you already know what you're going to read before you even read it. But I want to bring something to your attention. God, the Almighty God, who made the heavens and the earth, sent his Son into the world, a man who is the Son of God. And he is the only righteous man that ever lived. He is the heir of all things. He, in, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is the ruler and Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of lords and King of kings. And when he was walking on this earth, there were a, f a small group of men who were his disciples. And they got the privilege to walk with him, to sit at his feet and listen to him to sleep in the same room with him, to eat with him, break bread with him, to, to listen to his teachings, to watch him walk and talk and learn directly from him. And then there was another man who got that opportunity to do, to, to do many of those things with him, but after his resurrection. And <clears throat> that man, Paul, the apostle of Christ, is the one who wrote this letter. So we need to remember, and I'm not exalting Paul as if he's any different than you and I are as concerning his flesh, but because he's just a man just like you and I are, um, and if you're a man, maybe you're a woman, but he's human just like you and I are. And um, he, Paul was in the presence of the living God. He was chosen specifically by Jesus Christ. And the same gospel that the other apostles, the other 12 apostles, learned from Jesus Christ when he was walking in, in Jewry, um, this man, Paul, learned from him after his resurrection. And he was in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The man who is writing this letter, the man who wrote this letter that we are reading right now, this isn't just a, some sort of a theological work that we are to kind of try and decode by trying to, you know, learn the Greek language and all that foolishness and nonsense. And I'm not saying that it's bad to learn the Greek language. I'm just saying that when, you know, when people uh, learn theology and they, and they think that they understand Greek when they don't because they've been reading books from so-called Greek scholars and that kind of nonsense, is they just do it for the purpose of changing the Word of God around to accommodate doctrines that aren't in the Bible. That's what theology is. Theology is the art of misusing foreign languages in order to create doctrines that aren't in the Bible and convince yourself of lies. That's what theology is. <clears throat> anyway, pardon me, I didn't mean to go off on that, but and I, and I have done it before and I'll do it again, so just get used to it. Um, <laughs> Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, wrote this letter, and we need to understand, not to reverence Paul as if he were a god or anything, but to, to understand the gravity of what we have in our hands when we're reading this. That it's not just some religious book that we are to try to figure out through theology. It is a letter written by a man who was in the presence of God, who was caught up into the third heaven, who, who received these things from Jesus Christ personally, just like you and I can. And so we need to take these things very seriously. Okay, we, When we open our Bible, we need to open it with this in mind, that everything that we're reading in the Holy Bible is something that came directly from the Almighty God, the Creator of heaven and earth, by means of a prophet or an apostle, or His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what we're reading. Now let's start again in verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Okay, The ordinances that Paul, the Apostle of Christ, 
delivered unto the church. Right? These are not good suggestions. These are the commandments of God. Because remember, Jesus said, Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to what? To observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So, and Paul even wrote in another place, the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Just a couple chapters later in 1 Corinthians 14. So, he says in verse 3, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Right? This is what Paul the Apostle of Christ is declaring. The head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Okay, God, Christ, man, woman. That's the order of subjection. Okay, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. All right, if you're a man, when you begin to pray to the Lord, if you have something on your head that can be taken off, then you take it off. Why? Because if you leave it on, you're dishonoring your head, which is Jesus Christ. The Bible said, Paul just said right here, the head of the man is Christ. So, if you're a man, your head is Christ. And if you are, and when I say your head is Christ, I'm talking about headship, someone who is in headship over you, all right? Christ is not your head, the ball of flesh that's on top of your neck. He's your head in the sense that he is over you. He is your Lord and Master. And if you're a woman, Christ is your Lord and Master, and your husband also is your Lord and Master. Okay? There are some of you that might think that sounds a little far out or whatever. Well, guess what? Those of us who are Christians are strangers and pilgrims in this world. We belong to a royal priesthood. We belong to a kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. And if you can't figure out how to act in a kingdom, then you're not going to enter into the kingdom, the holy royal kingdom of the living God. And that's going to be part of this message. Okay, and I didn't mean to, to make that sound sarcastic. I meant to make it sound um, like something that needs to make something click in your, in your mind and in your heart to cause you to understand this isn't just a religion. This is the kingdom of the Almighty God. It's about the kingdom of God. And I know that many of us, we, we don't really know what a kingdom is because the kingdoms of this world are, um, are, are hidden from view. Okay, the kingdoms of this world are hidden from view, and they're they're masked over by the the facade of democracy and the and the election shows and all the things that the that the royalty do in order to fool the people into thinking that they can choose their own leaders. But there are kingdoms in this world. There are royalty in this world. There are royalty that belong to Satan, but they're still royalty. Okay, and in a royal palace, you act and conduct yourself a certain way. All right? In a royal palace, you don't run around in your underwear. Okay? In your royal bedroom, you can run around in your underwear all you want. But when you go to the royal ballroom, you don't run around in your underwear. And when you go out in public in your limousine, you don't go out in your underwear. You go out dressed. See? That's how people act in a royal kingdom. Now, the Satan's kingdom, Satan's royal kingdom, people don't always adhere to that. And some of the women in Satan's royal kingdom dress like whores uh, when they go out with, you know, dresses that, you know, are like their cleavage is all the way down to here. Or, you know, it's cut all the way down here to show their cleavage and other things like that. But I, you know what I mean. But basically in a royal kingdom, when you're a princess, you do not go outside in your underwear. Okay. Or a prince, you do not go outside in your underwear. Just kind of hang on to that for a minute because I want to talk about that later in the, in the message. So Paul says, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. So I'm a man, my head is Christ. If I'm wearing a hat, you know, I have a cowboy hat that I wear sometimes because when I go out, the sun kind of bothers my eyes if it's real sunny. So I wear a cowboy hat But uh, when I'm walking. But if I go inside somewhere, I take it off because that's just basic respect. That's how I was raised. And of course, if I'm going to pray to the Lord, then I take it off. Why do I take it off? Because if I pray with my head covered, I'm dishonoring my head, which is Jesus Christ. Okay? This verse of scripture is not talking about my hair. Okay? The fact that I have hair doesn't mean that I'm dishonoring Jesus Christ unless I shave a little circle on top of my head, like the monks do in some Catholic uh, uh, monasteries. 
because of their misunderstanding of this particular passage of the scripture. And that's kind of ridiculous with all due respect to them as men. So um, th it's not talking about the fact that I should take my shave my hair off before I pray. It's talking about if I have something on my head covering my head. And just like that hat right up there. And so um, if I have that hat on right up there and I'm going to pray to the Lord, then I take my hat off because I don't want to pray with my head covered. It's just that simple. And in the same way, Paul says in verse 5, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Okay, who is her head? Well, Paul just said in verse 2, her head is her husband. He is her Lord and Master. If you're a married woman, your husband is your Lord and your Master. Okay, he is the, he is the one who owns you now. He took you out of your father's house and brought you into his house. Now you're called by his name, you're his property, and he is your Lord and Master. Okay, and that's the reality of the situation. I know that there's a lot of people that are raising their eyebrows and a lot of feminists who are saying, who do you think you're, you know, I, well, you know, take that somewhere else because this is a Christian ministry and I'm reading to you the words of the living God. Okay, the man is the head of the woman. A marriage isn't a 50-50 partnership. Okay, a marriage between a man and a woman isn't a business venture. It isn't two people opening up a taco stand and having each, you know, 50% 50, 50 interest in the company. It is a marriage. It is a, the woman was created for the man to be a help meet for him. And the man takes a woman to be his wife, and she is his servant. She lives in his house, and she loves him and serves him, and he provides for her, and he cares for her and cherishes her, and she reverences him. That's how it works. That's what a marriage is. That's what it was ordained to be from the beginning. So the man is the head of the woman. All right? The man is the head of the woman. And so if the woman is praying to God, uncovered, excuse me, yes, uncovered, with her head uncovered, then she is dishonoring her head. And not only is her head her husband, but also the head of her husband is Christ. So she's not only dishonoring her husband, she's also dishonoring Christ. And also the head of Christ is God. So she's not only dishonoring her husband, she's also dishonoring Christ, and she's also dishonoring God. Why? Because she's praying unto God with her head uncovered. Okay? This doesn't mean that she doesn't have hair on. It means that she doesn't have a veil over her head. All right? And I know the word veil isn't in 1 Corinthians 11, but it's obvious. Okay? This is not talking about a man's hair and a woman's hair. This is talking about men and women having their head covered. And so when a woman prays unto God, she needs to have her head covered with a veil, a piece of cloth that she puts over her head, which covers her the same way that her hair does, because her hair is given her by nature for a covering. You see? So her hair, the same way that her hair covers her, her long hair, because it's a good and right thing for a woman to have long hair, because her long hair is a glory to her, because it is given to her by nature for a covering. That shows us the way that she ought to cover her head with a veil. Okay? Now, if a woman needs to cover her head with a veil when she prays or prophesies, then when is she supposed to wear her veil? Is she just supposed to wear it when she goes to church? And I do that because there's no such thing as going to church, but you know what I mean. Is it just supposed to be in the church house? Or is it just supposed to be just when she's praying on her knees? Well, you know, the Bible says, pray without ceasing. And so... You know, when we are in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, there's not really any time when we're not going to be prone to speak to him. You know, whether we're walking down the street or whether we're, you know, whether you're a woman and you're cooking dinner or whatever the case may be. You know, when I'm walking down the street and I begin to talk to the Lord, I take my hat off because I don't want to have my head covered. Well, if you're a woman and you're walking down the street and, and you're my sister in the Lord and you want to talk to the Lord, you want to pray, you need to pray for someone or you need to speak the word of God to someone. Well, if you don't have your head covered, then you're dishonoring your husband and Jesus Christ and God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so how do you avoid that? Well, you cover your head. Okay. Now, in videos in time past and on this channel, I have not specifically told women in the body of Christ that they need to cover their head all the time, although I have alluded to that. But I haven't specifically said that as it were a command to the sisters in Christ, because I understand that there are some who are young in the faith and they're not going to be able to receive that. 
However, at this time, and because of the nature of this letter, I'm going to say this, okay? When you are a woman, you're a female, and you are a Christian. When you go out of your house, okay, except for when you are alone with your husband in your house, when you go out of your house, your head ought to be covered with a veil. Your hair ought to be put away so that nobody can see it. Because your hair is a glory to you, and you are, you're, you are your husband's glory. The woman is the glory of the man. And your hair, your long hair, is given you by nature for a covering. It is a glory to you. It is part of your beauty. Okay? And we know this because there's a, there's a big, huge industry in this world um, that makes billions and billions of dollars because of the fact that a woman's hair is her glory. And, and you know, shampoos and conditioners and curl, things to curl straight hair and things to straighten curly hair and things to, you know, color your hair different colors and all kinds of things that you can buy and, and, and go to, you know, professionals that can do things to your hair because your hair is your glory. That the, uh, the, the, the long hair of a woman is her glory, okay? Now, the error of the world concerning this is that women walk around with their hair uncovered all the time showing off their hair, even in churches, even in Christian churches. Okay, the women have their hair uncovered. This is an ungodly thing. It is a sinful thing. Yes, I said that. I've never actually said that before, but I'm saying it now. Okay, it is a sinful thing for you, a woman, especially a married woman, but any woman, to be a Christian and to go out into the world with your hair uncovered. It is the same as if you had your breasts uncovered or your buttocks uncovered or your thighs uncovered. It is part of your nakedness. Now you're saying, Brother Clinton, you've just gone a little bit too far. You need to, you need to back that up with scripture, my, my man, okay? Um, first of all, I don't back things up with scripture. I speak the scripture, okay? Those of us who are in Jesus Christ, we don't back up what we say with the scripture. Our Lord Jesus Christ didn't back up what he said with the scripture. He spoke the scripture, and so have I. But I want to show you what I'm talking about, just for example. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 47. In Isaiah chapter 47, the prophet was speaking the words of God against a system that is called Babylon, a religious system uh, that is called Babylon. It existed in the days when Isaiah prophesied. Uh, it began to exist in the days of Nimrod, and it still exists today, the, the very same system. And the very same kinds of people that wear the same kinds of outfits and they have the same kind of religion. It's just all called by different names than it used to be. But it's the same thing. Okay, Today it's called the Roman Catholic Church and her Protestant denominations. But back then, uh, this is what the Bible calls it, the uh, Babylon, the daughter of the Chaldeans. And she is Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She is a whore. Okay, And... Jesus showed John a vision of her likened unto a woman in the Revelation. And God is showing Isaiah these things and speaking through the prophet Isaiah about this system, personifying this system as a woman. Okay? A harlot, a whorish woman. Let's read Isaiah chapter 47. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. In other words, God's saying, I am taking your throne away, and you're going to be sitting right in the dust. Take the millstones and grind meal. Yeah, you're, not, you're not going to have any servants anymore to do that for you. If you want some meal, grind it yourself. Now look what God says. Uncover thy locks. Make bare the leg. Uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. Now look at what he says. Uncover thy locks. Was he talking about the padlocks on her front doors? No. He was talking about the locks of her hair. The locks of her hair. He's likening Babylon unto a woman. And he says, uncover thy locks, make bare the leg. Okay, the leg is referring to the part of her leg between her foot and her knee. How do I know that? Because he goes on to say, uncover the thigh. That's talking about the rest of her leg. And moving upward, pass over the rivers. Okay, you can use your imagination there as what God is referring to. It's referring to her nakedness. Uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. Now, a woman who is walking around with her hair uncovered, 
is exposing her nakedness to the world. She's exposing to the world something that should only be seen by her husband. Okay? This is the truth of God's word. And if you belong to the royal priesthood of the living God, and you belong to the kingdom of the living God, then, my brothers and my sisters, you and I need to be not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Here's the thing, okay? If you're a woman and you're a Christian, you have been raised up in an ungodly world all of your life, and just like I was. And you and I were taught wrong all of our lives from the, from the moment we began to see things and speak a language. We were taught how to act wrong, think wrong, and talk wrong all of our lives. And now we've come to the kingdom of the living God. We are not of this world. Okay, If you want to be of this world, you can be, of course, but I wouldn't advise it because this world is perishing and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Okay, so And I speak to you in love, my brothers and my sisters, especially you, the brother who wrote, and hopefully your wife is there with you um, uh, listening to this message as well. So you and I were raised up in an ungodly world. And we were taught, just like I, you know, when I was 17 years old, I used to walk around with, you know, tennis shoes on and, and cut off shorts and no shirt. And to me, that was normal. But <clears throat> there was a time when I was about, when I was just past 18 years old, and a man, one of my neighbors, asked me if I wanted to visit him in his apartment, and he didn't have anything good on his mind. And I didn't realize it at the time, but later on, as I grew and I, and I, Especially when I became a Christian, I realized, ah, well, of course, you know, he saw me running around half naked. He was a sodomite and he wanted to be my boyfriend. Okay. And uh, of course, you know, nothing like that happened, but he made a, he made an advance at me. And I thought that was very weird. And I just said, well, no, but you know, have a nice day. And I left, but uh, and thank God that he didn't get violent with me or anything like that. Cause I was inside of his apartment, but you know, that was because of my naivety. I was running around half naked and wound up inside the apartment of a sodomite. And what could have, you know, if, if he hadn't been a polite person, he was, you know, mentally ill, but if he hadn't been a polite, mentally ill person, I might have been dead. I might have wound up dead because of that, because of my indiscretion. You see? And there's a lot of people that would say, what's the matter with that? It's hot outside, you know? It, it was summer, and you're running around in shorts. You know, you're a young man. Well, there's a lot of things wrong with it. It's, you know, my nakedness shouldn't be seen in public and neither should yours. Again, you know, I was in Phoenix and I was walking down the street one day and I ran into a girl, a very pretty girl. And uh, she was maybe 25-ish, something like that. And she was dressed like a stripper on the street. I mean, she had a little tube top and a little short skirt that was, you know, maybe about this long. It went about this 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 far past her underwear and um and she was wearing high heels and you know i was a christian at the time but i had been you know in strip clubs in time past in my in my younger days and i know what strippers dress like and she was dressed like a stripper on the street and so i couldn't resist i just had to walk up to her and talk to her and tell her about the lord and um she as i was speaking to her um she said that she was a christian and i said you're a Christian? And she said, yes. And I said, why are you dressed like a whore? And wow, you should have seen her face. It was like I just you know, descended from Mars or something. She was like, oh, what are you talking about? How can you use that kind of language with me? You know, I'm a Christian, but I've been to strip clubs in the past, and this is how strippers dress on stage. Why aren't you embarrassed to be outside walking around like this? And she said, I'm covered. My nakedness is covered. See, to, to people in this world, their nakedness means their nipples and their genitals, if I may be so, you know, <laughs> so, so exact. But um, that, there's more to your nakedness than that. Okay, there's more to your nakedness than that. Um, and she was running around half naked. And I asked her, you know, she said something about she had a boyfriend. I said, you have a boyfriend? She said, yes. I said, and he lets you walk around like this? And she was like, he's nobody to let me do anything. I do what I want. And so at that point, you know, the conversation was pretty much over. But, you know, it's, during the conversation, she also said, well, it's hot outside. And I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm here in the same place and it's 90 something degrees outside, but I'm fully dressed and you're half naked. So, you know, you can do whatever you want. But if you say that you're a Christian, then I have to tell you that 
you know, Christians don't dress like that. Christian women don't dress like that. And of course she didn't accept that. She got upset and she, she got all miffed and she walked away. I like that word miffed. It's kind of like when a, when a cat has a little attitude fit, they go. But anyway, um, people in this world think that that's okay, but it's not okay. You see, that's why the Bible says, be not conformed to this world. If you are a woman and you're wearing shorts, that's underwear. Okay, that's underwear. If you're a woman and you're wearing pants, you're cross-dressing. You're wearing clothes that pertain to a man. There are no pants that are acceptable for a woman to wear. I know you're saying, Brother Clinton, there are women's pants, and there's all sorts of, of feminists that want to argue with me right now and sodomites that want to argue with me. Save it. I'm not going to argue with you, okay? Pants are for a man. Dresses and skirts are for a woman, okay? If you don't agree with that, then you're just deceiving yourself because if you go to a restaurant and go to a public restroom, you can see that there are images on the doors for people who can't read, men and women, and there are images on the doors of a man and a woman. And the image of the man is the one who is wearing pants. And the image of the woman is the one who is wearing a skirt. And therefore, anybody, even if you can't read, knows which restroom is for which gender. Okay? There are two genders, male and female. That's the only two genders there are, by the way. Um, these days, you have to clarify that, unfortunately. So, pants are for a man. Dresses and skirts are for a woman. Women's pants are an oxymoron. Women's pants were designed by the fallen angels in order to expose women's nakedness in public, okay? And to tempt men, to be a snare for men. That's what women's pants are, okay? Pants are for men. Dresses and skirts are for women. And there are many women who have written to me and said, well, you know, how am I supposed to wear pants while I'm out doing this? You know, while I'm out you know, riding motorcycles and skiing and doing all this stuff. Well, you know, why do you have to do all those things? Why do you think that you have to do things that require you to wear men's clothing? If you can't do something without wearing men's clothing to do it, then you shouldn't be doing that. That's my answer. Praise the Lord. So, um, having said that, women, there is no reason for, there is no good reason for you to put on a pair of pants. Pants are for men. Dresses and skirts are for women. If you're, a woman, if you're a woman wearing clothes that pertain to a man, you are an abomination to the Lord. That's not my opinion. That's what the scripture says. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord. Okay? If you are a woman dressed in men's clothing, you are an abomination to God. If you are a man dressed in women's clothing, then you are an abomination to God. That's abominable. God can't stand that. He hates it. And nobody that does it is going to enter into his presence, period. All right. Shorts. If a woman wants to wear shorts in the bedroom to entertain her husband, that is all fine and good. She can wear, she can put on whatever he wants her to put on. You know, lingerie, uh, you know, uh, uh, int, how do they call it? I'm thinking ropa intima in Spanish, but um, intimate clothing, what they call it, um, I guess lingerie is the word for it. Um, you know, I'm <laughs> learning Spanish. So I'm starting to forget English. Please pray for me. But, um, you know, you can wear whatever you want in your bedroom, as long as you're not wearing men's clothes and your husband isn't wearing women's clothes, of course. But because that's still an abomination to God. But, I mean, if you want, if you're, a, uh, you know, a man's wife and you want to put on shorts in, in the bedroom or in your house in private while you're cooking dinner for him or whatever, so that he can see, you know, your nakedness while you're wearing shorts, that's wonderful. Praise the Lord. You're his wife. Your nakedness is for him to see. But you, there, there's no reason that you should be going outside dressed like that. And if you if you go outside dressed like that and you're not ashamed of yourself, then something's wrong and you really need to draw nearer to the Lord. Because that's and I and I and I and I know who I'm talking to, the brother and sister that the well, the brother that wrote and his wife, I know that I'm speaking to you directly, and I know that this is kind of kind of in your face, maybe uh, kind of direct, but it needs to be. It needs to be. And, and for many of you out there who are not the one who wrote, but have been wondering about this as well, it needs to be. Okay? There is no excuse for you, if you're a Christian, to be walking around in shorts. Now, especially if you're a woman, because you're exposing your nakedness. Your legs are your nakedness. And even the part of you that is covered with those shorts is covered so tightly that it exposes what's underneath. And that's 
sin. Okay, If you're a woman, you need to be dressed in a dress or a skirt, something that covers your nakedness from your neckline to your feet. Okay, Now, uh, Pastor Clinton, how many inches does my dress need to be for my shoes? Don't ask me that. Okay, You should know that. If you have the Holy Ghost, you should know that. Uh, Pastor Clinton, how many, don't call me Pastor Clinton, by the way, but I'm just saying this as an example. You know, Pastor Clinton, how many, how many inches should my sleeve be for my wrist? You know, well, that's, that's, you're, you're a man of God, okay? The Holy Ghost will show you, okay? Is it okay to wear a short sleeve shirt? For me, I, I wear short sleeve shirts, you know, to here all the time. I live in Costa Rica, but do I walk around in a tank top? No, I don't. In my house, I do, but outside, I do not, because that's underwear, a tank top is underwear. Shorts are underwear. If you're a man, there is no reason for you to be wearing shorts in public. That's underwear. If you're in your house, you fine. You can wear whatever you want with the you know with the, the shades drawn and the, and, the, and the curtains closed. Sure, you know you can wear whatever you want. Um, I remember a, I went to a church meeting a long time ago, and the pastor was preaching. And uh, this is wow, maybe I don't even know twenty years ago. And. Uh, no, it wasn't that long ago. I don't know exactly how long. It doesn't matter. But um, the pastor was preaching, and he was talking about it. He, he went to a pastor's conference, and he met this other guy who was a pastor. And this other guy who was a pastor walks up to him in shorts, short pants. <laughs> and the pastor, this particular pastor was like, and, and he reaches out his hand to shake his hand. This pastor's like, where's the rest of your pants? <laughs> I mean, when he met this man, this man introduced him to him. And the first thing this pastor said was, Where's the rest of your pants? And rightly so. <laughs> That's what he should have said. And this man should have been embarrassed by that. Because if you're a man of God, then you shouldn't be walking around with pants that are cut off above your knees. Your pants should go down to your feet. That's what pants are for. Pants are a garment that are meant to cover your nakedness. So if you want to wear cut off pants in your house with your wife, fine. You know, praise the Lord. But the, your wife is the only one that should see your nakedness. And by the way, if you have children in your house, they should not see your nakedness ever. The children, the, the children should not see the nakedness of their parents. And this is written way back in the 18th chapter of Leviticus. Okay. It is sinful for you if you're a parent for your child to see your nakedness. They should never know what you look like naked. Okay. They came from your body. That's the last time they should ever see your body. Okay, and they were too busy crying to pay attention anyway. Other than that, your child should never see you naked. Of course, little babies, they breastfeed. I understand that. But your children should never see you naked. Okay, that is sin. And if you're walking around in your house in your underwear or with short pants on or with no shirt on or whatever, with your children present, that's not proper. Okay, if you want to be like that in, in the bedroom with your wife or your husband, hey, praise the Lord, that's awesome. But when you go out of your bedroom and your children are there in the house, put some clothes on. Your children don't need to see your nakedness, and they don't need to be taught that it's okay to walk around like that, because it's not. Okay? I'm saying some very direct things here, but they need to be said. All right? So, if you're wearing shorts, your nakedness is being discovered. If you're a woman and your hair is uncovered, your locks are uncovered, then your nakedness is exposed. And the only time that that is acceptable is when you're alone with your husband. Okay? That's the only time that it's acceptable. And it's more than acceptable. It's wonderful because your, your hair is a glory to you. You're supposed to be you know, uh, exposing your glory to your husband and presenting yourself, all of yourself, to your husband. And it's wonderful that you would you know, brush your hair and, do, and take care of it and you know, shampoo it and condition it and you know, maybe trim off the dead ends or whatever. So, and I'm not saying cut your hair, but you know, trim off the dead ends so it grows better and things like that and, and take good care of your hair. You should because your hair is beautiful. It, and it's beautiful for a reason, for your husband, for you to serve your husband in intimacy in the bedroom. That's what your beauty is for. That's why God made you beautiful the way that you are. He didn't make you beautiful the way that you are to flaunt your beauty in public. Now, here's the thing that I sp started to speak about a little while ago about being conformed to this world. We were all taught that it's good and right to flaunt our beauty in public, okay? Whether we're male or female. I don't know if it's appropriate to, to use the word beauty for a male so but anyway we're all taught that you know it's 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 a good thing to show our attractive nature our attractive side in public and you know for men to walk around with 
you know, tight shirts that are buttoned down to here so they can, you know, people can see the hair on our chest and tight pants so that people can see everything that we have uh, underneath our clothing. Um, and, you know, women walking around with pants on that, that are so ridiculously tight that you can read the date on a quarter in her back pocket, um, which is ridiculous. And, and, you know, I live in, in Costa Rica. I think San Jose, Costa Rica, it has to be the tight pants capital of the world. Um, it is just ridiculous walking out in the street here the way women walk around parading their nakedness in the world. And, and they do that because that's the way they've been taught by Satan through the television and movies. But those of us who are Christians, now we're not to be conformed to this world. And so we have to deny ourselves and take up our crosses and follow Jesus, which means that it's not for us anymore to go out into public flaunting our nakedness you know whether we're whether we're unclothed like like this, okay, or whether we have clothes on but they're pulled so tight that everybody can see what's underneath. It doesn't matter. It's still nakedness, okay. Like for instance, there's a video on this channel that's called "Yoga Pants or Underwear," and it's true. Yoga pants, you know, tights, they're underwear. They were made for women to wear under their skirt when they're dancing or sometimes when it's cold. That's what yoga pants or tights are. And there are women that walk around with yoga pants or tights on without anything covering them up. And you can see every form of their, you can, it's just like looking at them naked. They are naked, except there's just a little thin piece of cloth stretched really tightly around every curve and every nook and cranny of their body. And they have no shame. They have no shame whatsoever, but they're naked. And one woman said to me one time in the, in the comment forum here, she said, I can't have pants on and be naked. And that was ridiculous. And, and my answer was just very concise. Yes, you can. You most certainly can. And so this is the thing, my brothers and my sisters. We belong to the royal kingdom of the living God. We are princes and princesses. We have been given grace for grace. Pardon me. Grace for grace. What does that mean? The grace of God is upon us so that we can walk with grace. What does it mean to walk with grace? It means to walk as a prince or a princess. Okay. How is a princess dressed? She has a dress on. A lot of times she has her little tiara. And, you know, she has a dress on that goes down to the floor and covers her nakedness. A princess doesn't walk around with tight-fitting little shorts and tube tops and things like that, tight-fitting t-shirts and things like that that expose her nakedness. She has grace, and a gracious woman retaineth honor. You see, if you're a beautiful woman, that's wonderful. Be beautiful to your husband. But when you go out in the street, it doesn't mean you can't be beautiful. It means that you're beautiful in a, in a different way. You're not presenting your sexuality to people in the street like you present your sexuality to your husband in the bedroom. See, but you can present your beauty to people in the street which is you know, your, your, your face and your demeanor and nice clothing. They have nothing wrong with nice clothing. Nothing wrong with a nice dress. Okay? I mean, you know, my, when I walk with my wife, we have, you know, when we walk by a store that has a dress, we both of us turn our heads. Wow, look at that dress. That's pretty nice. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a nice dress. But it shouldn't be something that exposes your nakedness. It shouldn't be something that looks like a go-go dancer or somebody that's, you know, on a stage about to take it off. Okay? It should be something decent. It should be something worthy of a dignified servant of the living God, a princess. That's how we should go outside. That's how we should present ourselves outside. So if you're a Christian sister, when you go out of your house, your head should be covered. And what I mean is that your hair should be covered. Nobody should see your hair. And your body should be covered. You should have a dress on or a skirt and a top that covers your nakedness. And your beauty is in the glory that radiates through you by Jesus Christ. And as the scripture says, as I just quoted, a gracious woman retaineth honor. People will respect you and honor you greatly, much more so than when you walk around dressing inappropriately. Okay? And they will not be looking you up and down and looking at parts of your body and dishonoring you in public and dishonoring your husband in public. When you're walking around, if you're a woman and you're walking around with shorts and a t-shirt on in public, you're dishonoring your husband because you're showing to the world something that only belongs to your husband. You're, you're walking around just like a billboard advertising. See my stuff? 
Yeah. This, hey, hey, anybody want to see my stuff? Here I am. That's what it is. And, and I know I, this may sound really kind of brash, but I think it needs to be under the circumstances because there's many people in the churches that just don't get it yet. They just don't realize. And, and people in the churches, a lot of them, they just want to say, well, how much can I get away with? What can I do without, you know, sinning against God? Where's the line? Well, really, my brother, my sister, if you're looking for the line, then you're not sold out to Jesus. If you're looking for the line and you haven't denied yourself and taken up your cross and followed Jesus, if you can't really be comfortable with not flaunting your beauty or your body or your sexuality in the world just because that's what you're used to and you like doing that, then you haven't denied yourself. You haven't died to yourself. You haven't turned from your sins. And you really don't have the concept yet of what it is to live in a royal kingdom. Okay, and, and I'm not saying this to insult you. I'm saying this because you and I both, we were so filled with the ways of this world for so long that it takes being washed with water by the word of God to realize that things that we thought were perfectly normal are really not perfectly normal at all to the kingdom of God. And so a woman should be covered when she's in public, cover her head, cover her body. A man should also be covered when he's in public. He should be wearing a shirt and pants that cover his nakedness. This is the way it is supposed to be. There really is no gray area. Now, if you want to call, you know, the, the length of a man's sleeve a gray area, you know, should it be down, should it be to the elbow? You know, should it be to the elbow or should it be to here or should it be, you know, buttoned up around his wrist? Well, I'm not going to tell you that, okay? I'm not going to make rules like Pentecostal pastors do and say your dress has to be two inches from your shoe and, and your sleeve has to be, you know, an inch from your wrist or whatever. Or your, your shirt, this button has to be buttoned right here. You have to have a tie on. You have to wear a tie if you want to be a minister and all the, the, the silly rules that they make up in the Pentecostal churches because the people in the Pentecostal churches aren't born of God. And so they have to be taught rules. But if you're born of God, then you know these things, you understand these things, and you hear the words that I'm speaking to you, and they're, they're ministering to your spirit, and you understand. So I hope that these things have been a blessing to you, brother who wrote, and also the sister who's with you, your wife. And I hope that these things have been a blessing to many of you as well. I know, again, I know I stepped on some toes here, and I didn't mean to do that in order to bruise anybody's toenails. I just felt that it was necessary at this point to just be blunt and to just come right out and say things that I have said in a roundabout way in time past, but didn't really come out and, and say. Because you know what? YouTube isn't the church of Jesus Christ. And, you know, you're watching me because you're interested in hearing the word of God, but yet we're not in a church meeting and anybody in the whole world can watch this video. So I'm not saying that I hold back the word of God in order to not offend people. What I'm saying is that there are certain things that are said in a church meeting that need to be said in a church meeting. And there are other things that, you know, speaking in public, they, they don't need to be said. And these were some of those things. But at the same time, I said them because I felt um, in my spirit that these things needed to be clarified and clarified perfectly to, to a blunt, uh, to a blunt point. That's a, that's an oxymoron, but to a, how should I say this? to an exact degree, without holding anything back, no beating around the bush, okay? Um, if you're a woman, you should not be wearing pants. If you're wearing, if you're a woman wearing pants, you're an abomination to God, period. End of story. It uh, doesn't matter what kind of pants they are. Um, if you're a woman wearing shorts and you're walking around in public or in front of your children that way, that's a sin, okay? I'm saying it right out in the open, it's a sin. It's ungodly and it is, it is um, improper and it is immodest. Um, if you're a man and you're walking around wearing shorts in public or in front of your children, that's a sin that is ungodly and it is immodest. The only place that you should be wearing shorts if you want to wear shorts is in your bedroom alone or with your husband or wife. That's the only place that you should be wearing shorts, period. End of story. Um, if you're a woman, you need to have your head covered at all times, when you're, especially when you're out in public. If you're, if you're at home with your husband, you can uncover your hair all you want. Just cover it when you pray. You know, when you're going to go to pray. But when you go outside, you should never go outside with your hair uncovered, with your head uncovered, any more than you would go outside without your, you know, your breasts covered. If you were, if, you know, you shouldn't go outside without your veil any more than you would go outside without your shirt, if you're my sister in Christ. That's how it is. And if you're a man, you should be fully dressed. 
when you go outside. Okay, now that's that's the reality of the situation. Okay, you asked. Here's the reality of the situation. A woman's hair is part of her nakedness. We saw that from the scripture. Her leg, her thigh, where her rivers come forth, that's her nakedness. Okay, it's not just a person's nipples and genitals like the world thinks. You know, I mean, strippers on stage have little pasties on. You know what pasties are? If you don't, don't worry about it. And, you know, a little G-string and they cover up the, that which the world thinks is their nakedness. Well, it is your nakedness, but there's a lot more to your nakedness than that. Your nakedness goes from what's in between your feet and your neck. Okay, that's your nakedness, and that shouldn't be seen by anybody except your spouse. It shouldn't be seen by your children or your neighbors or anybody except your spouse. So there's the answer to the question. For those of you who love the Lord Jesus Christ, peace be unto you. And I'm here for you if you have questions. In Jesus' name. Ah, but earnest questions and desiring the truth. Amen.